Hi everyone and welcome to Tap Into Your Creativity. Today we have you guys. We are having Dr. Nancy Hillies and um, and there she is. Hey Sandra. <laughs> you did it. You did it beautifully, Nancy. <laughs> it worked this time, Sandra. It was all it your worked. coaching. It worked beautifully. I'm so happy. Thank you I so know. much for joining us on part two. If you guys missed the first one, it was over a year ago. Can you believe this, Nancy? Over a year ago? I can't believe it. It went fast. <laughs> it went really fast. I I am uh, I can't believe. But let me just tell the audience a little bit about you and um, who you are, other than my good friend that I've just come to love and adore. And I have in, been enriched by your friendship um, and you are just an incredible human being. Um, but you, Nancy, are an MD. You um, are an abstract artist, but also you were trained in Stanford as a psychiatrist. And you are an author <laughs> and a best-selling author of self-help books, The Artist's Journey. And then you have a new book, which we'll be talking about because you have a co-author, which is your husband, Bruce Saw Sawhill. And um, I can't wait to, for him to join us and for you guys to talk about the new book called The uh, Adjacent Possible. So without further ado, welcome to the program. Thank you, Sandra. It's great to be here. And this time we've got color behind us. I see the yeah. color behind you and I do too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy. I love it, Nancy. Tell us what's been going on for you for the last year. And for people that don't know you necessarily, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Yeah. So, well, I, you know, am an artist and an author and an existential psychiatrist. And I've been painting for years. I started out in sculpture and I've been teaching courses, you know, the artist journey, studio journey, masterclass, and all these things, live workshops, and so forth for a number of years now. And um, so that's been going on. Started writing books a few years ago. And this past year has been a roller coaster. So <clears throat> we had eight deaths in eight months. So a lot of loss oh, going I'm on. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, thank you. I know. So just loss. We had a situation of our daughter being in that college admissions process, which was insanity this past year. <laughs> yeah, you and I talked about that. Yeah. That's the whole, yeah. Yeah, you know it's how a that is. And so Thankfully, you know, the the clouds parted and the sun came through and University of St. Andrews in Scotland said, yes. <laughs> so our daughter Kimmy is at St. Andrews studying oh art history. Wow. Yeah, art history and ancient history and just so excited. She loves it. And the people are so nice there in Scotland. So that's the bright light, <laughs> the, the light that came in this darkness. And in the midst of it, too, uh, I've been working on the adjacent possible with Bruce and We've been putting this together, and that's been also a light in this darkness. So that's what's been going on over here. Well, that's that's a lot, and 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 also you've had your master courses um, that you have been teaching, and so it's been a really um, full year, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and the master class has been so wonderful. Fabulous group of artists in there. And so we go on live every week and it, that's been, that's been like also a bright light to keep going and really encouraging one another. Through. How do you keep your, your courses fresh? And um, I guess we'll, we'll dive into this since we're talking about, um, about it. Um, how do you keep your courses fresh and who is your audience? Who are your students? So I think that one of the things that we found in the master class is we, you know, we we were doing these live hour, hour and a half, sometimes even two hour talks every week, going through the material together. And then what came out of that and came out of creative conversations, which I'm really a big fan of, 
not knowing ahead of time what's going to happen in the conversation and seeing what emerges, what came out of that was this idea to spotlight the artist in the masterclass to kind of like almost like a virtual studio visit. And what's really wonderful about that is you get to see them in their studio. You get to hear their voice. You get to hear about their process and what's going on for them. So that that is brought amazing freshness and a continual evolution in the course. So that's been a big aha this year. And um, anyone can join because it's on yeah. Zoom, I believe, right? So yeah, anyone who's in the master class <clears throat> can jump in. It's on Zoom, and we have it so that you know people are, are in the conversation. We're having this conversation. So that's really neat. Lots of ideas, sharing. Um, and, and that just, that brings that richness and the continual evolving of it because that is the creative conversation. We don't know what's going to happen in there. It's not scripted. So that's really cool. I love that. And, the, and that's the way, let me just interrupt yeah. for a second. It's an amazing way for community building. If, yeah. if looking to find a community of think alike people, this is an amazing opportunity for you to do that, correct? That's right. That's right. And it's for artists, who it is for is for artists who want to express themselves, their own unique lexicon and signature and language. And they want to move past emulating not only others, but themselves. They want to continually experiment and evolve their art. This is who it's for. And if that's something you're interested in, that's what we're about. The other piece we're about is the foundations and the principles, the kind of the root and the trunk of the tree, it, rather than the little limbs and the, the leaves out here. So we're not focused on technique per se. Now technique's okay, but it is not what art is. Okay, so we're about getting at the principles so that you can extrapolate from the principles and looking at nature and pulling from mathematics and from science and evolutionary biology and you know colors and all kinds of things. So that's what we're about. And the other part that um, I don't think you've mentioned is that you have a merger between both of your careers, which is psychiatry and art. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So, you know, I believe that, you know, our psychology, our inner landscape affects everything, not only in our lives, but our art, because art is a mirror. And, and what we've got to get to is giving ourselves permission, a sense of allowing and trust to say yes to the thing that scares us, to say yes to the thing that calls us to go in there and face the canvas and, and grapple down the, you know, the struggles that we get, the frustrations, and actually embrace it all, because that's all part of this process. And We're I facing think ourselves. Here, more, than, more than any other year, I think that the merger of art and psychiatry um, is so important. Um, it is some sort of a a scapegoat, if you want to call it that, um, that it's a safe place where you can just be you, where no one expects anything. Um, and that has to be so um, important and has to be validated. And yes. it helps, it helps so much, doesn't it, Nancy? Yes, Sandra, you nail it, you nail it. It helps so much. Art is healing. Art Art accesses meaning. It's existential. It's all about what we're, we come here to do, is really to get at that ineffable and to get at the mystery of who we are and to, to really go there and, and express whatever's coming through. Right. And did you ever did art as therapy? Did you ever use that in your, yes? Yes, I did. Okay. And I've also got a background in child and adolescent psychotherapy and psychiatry. And so I've worked with children as well. And sometimes, yeah, partic you know, particular uh, patients, it really was helpful to bring in art, you know, or, or and also pets. I, I have had every animal in my office, you can imagine, including a snake. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> 
<laughs> which is oh, scary. <laughs> I don't know if I wanted to be in, in that particular session with you. <laughs> Because I would say, hey, you know, what's meaningful to you? And if, you know, well, I, I love my snake. I was like, okay, bring your snake in. <laughs> <laughs> then oh, I've got to face my fears too, you know. Like. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so, um, you know, last time you really gave me an aha moment. And I want everyone here to hear my, my particular aha moment, which was the zero to one. Um, theory. And I just adore that theory and the way that you put it out there. So can can you tell us that all over again? Yes, I love this concept so much. It's from mathematics. And Bruce taught me this. And it's, it's the concept of zero to one is that the interval between zero and one, this interval is larger than one to two, two to three, three to four, and so on. In other words, from nothing to something is bigger than something to something. And so I extrapolate that to be analogous to what we're facing in art, what we're facing in life, what we're facing in anything. It might be, I need to get into the swimming pool, but you know, it's hard to start. Starting, you've got to start. And so if we realize the enormity of that interval, and really kind of the miracle of starting, starting anything, zero to one, it's huge. And so I'll literally go around telling myself, zero to one, Nancy, just go up to that swimming pool and put your toe in the water. You can always turn around and come back, but at least you did zero to one. And what we find is if you can just get in there, zero to one, oftentimes you'll just keep going. <laughs> I, I love that concept so much and I have integrated this in my life all the time. I think of it zero to one, you know, just start, just, you know, take that step. And there were so many people that were so hesitant this year to just start, to get something new, to do something good. And the minute that you just start, it's like, you know, something sparks in your mind and you're not afraid of it anymore. So you can continue that. So the two to three, the three to four becomes so much easier. Because Absolutely. it's like, you just, in your mind, you have that click, and then you did it. And it's like, yes, yes, me for taking the step. Yes, you're breaking through that surface tension. And you exactly. It, right? And then, yeah, something to something, it, it flows out of starting. So we got to start. So right. a lot of the work that I do with people is, let's, let's just start. And yeah. let's allow and have fun and, and you know, and then we open up those creative channels by just starting. So that that's so fun. And I can just see you. You're just radiant, Sandra. I just love I, I just, <laughs> you know, it just was such an aha moment for me because, you know, you are right. You pause. You always pause and you have that. And it is all inside of you to take that step. And if you're not afraid to taking that step, listen. When I started tapping to your creativity, I had no clue what I was getting into. Nothing. I just knew I had to do something to help some other people that were in need. I just didn't know how to do it. I just started doing it. And I Perfect. learned so much from that, but I didn't know how to do it. This is, and you're saying, this is very important what you're saying there. You is not knowing. You stepped into this. You had some kind of urge, something called you to do something about food insecurity and you had an idea, but you didn't know how to do it. What was it going to turn out into whatever? This is like facing the canvas. You don't know. And, and actually what I believe is that we need to embrace not knowing and actually go great. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to do this, but I'm going to go ahead anyway. And that's what you did. You said, yeah. yes. Yes, I don't know if I was like, yay, I was like <laughs> petrified, Nancy, I didn't know, I'm like, oh my god, all of a sudden I'm going to interview people, like, hello, I've never done this in my life, and yes. um, I guess I'm a perfect example of jumping into something that I had no clue, and I learned as I was going, and I was studying at night, and I was, you know, improving myself every time, but I knew that I was going to do something for the better of not only myself, but to help others. 
So, so the zero to one applied without even me knowing that that was, you know, my mantra now. <laughs> it's perfect. And it was an iterative process. You know, right. and you don't have to get it right, so to speak, right off the bat. It's like you're finding your way. You're searching and finding your way. The most important thing is you said yes, and you went for it. Yes, exactly. So, <laughs> um, Nancy, tell us a little bit about your book, uh, which has been not a, a best-selling um, book. And how did the idea come to be? Yeah. Uh, because I think that, you know, you really captured um this hole that was needed and i think that is why you know all of us have benefited so much from your book thank you so much sandra i'll show you the, the image of it <laughs> and so oh. if you notice this painting is this painting back here if you can see that <laughs> yes yes so i yes. love i love that <laughs> yeah that's not possible <laughs> but before we go there yeah. Do you have the Artist Journey one, too? I do. Hold on just a second. Let me show you the Artist Journey. That was the, this was the beginning. This was the one where I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, so I want you to talk about that one first. Let's, okay. let's talk about the Artist Journey because that is such an important book, and it has been such a relevant book for so long, and yeah. a best-selling book yeah, for so long. Is. Yeah, is. So tell us how that came about. Yeah. So the artist journey, you know, I was blogging and, and everything for since like 2015. And, and, you know, really a lot of what I do in terms of teaching and writing was, was very much kind of like a sermon, <laughs> um, an exhortation, inviting people to trust themselves and to, to live their most meaningful life. And this is really the work that I have been doing in uh, existential psychiatry for years, is, is trying to help people through the predicaments that they're facing and, and really live their most meaningful lives. And so that's what I'm interested in. And I, and I believe art reflects that. And so what happened is I, I wanted to write a book that would stand the test of time, that would get at kind of eternal principles. Um, and so that's what I wanted to do. And I, what happened is that I spoke this book, I spoke it out, and then I wrote it out after speaking it. And it by really it, is by speaking it, you understood more of the concept? Or why were you speaking it just to, to put it into action? Well, you know, it's interesting, you know, how like different modalities, it's, it's interesting to like, write, just write, it's interesting to speak and then tr transcribe that and then read what you spoke. It's interesting to listen to an, a recording. It's like different experiences. So I got different things from these different experiences. And you can bring this concept into your art as well, by the way. Um, you know, like you could, write a, you could write a poem and then you could paint from that poem you wrote. Then you could turn on an audio recording of that poem and have your, your paintings at an exhibition. Wouldn't that be interesting? Yeah. Multimodality. So I wanted to get at essentially the hero's journey. And that, that is very much informed by one of the most meaningful stories in my life, which goes back to age 17, which is Dante Alighieri and his divine comedy, uh, in particular, The Inferno. And it really was about those opening words, you know, in the middle of the road of my life, I awoke in a dark wood and the true way was wholly lost. And that was Dante lost in the middle of his life. Just as we find ourselves at different crossroads in our lives and we're, we don't know what to do. And it may be like we're in front of that canvas. I don't know what to do. It may be existential angst, whatever it is. But then the guide shows up, Virgil, the great Roman poet, the pagan Roman poet showed up to light the way. And then they're in it. They're diving deep. They're going down into the belly of the monster. They're going down into hell and facing the perils and facing, ultimately, Dante had to face himself. And that's that dark night of the soul, you know, or that's when Luke Skywalker, yes. you know, lets go <laughs> and he, 
he gets off and he just like trusts himself to go through there and, and you know, take care of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then we return back to our lives transformed at least a little bit. That, that story, those stories that are in the great literature and film, this is what moves me deeply. And this is what I wanted to, I want to put together the artist's journey is a hero's journey, a heroine's journey. And we're continually on our hero's or heroine's journey as artists and as people. So that's what that book is about. <laughs> so it's almost like jumping and letting go and floating in there and having all these experiences and how it affects you in a way that you're consumed by everything that's around you, but also most importantly, what's inside of you inside of you yes yes that's the transformation and we're continually spiraling we're doing this all the time it's uh ongoing <laughs> it's not just right. a one-time thing <laughs> right right i feel like sometimes we all fall into that ab ab abyss is that yeah. how we say it and um you know and it's it's that floating sensation and how you come up from that and how you can look forward and move forward from that um, yes. I think that that's how you really, truly are in the transformation part of it, because you're learning as you're standing from that. That's right. That's right. I thought it when you said, go, it's like you're going down, down, down into the abyss. And I thought about Beowulf, you know, going down to deal with, he had already dealt with Grendel, but now he's got to face Grendel's mother. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest the worst monster of all, right? <laughs> so, exactly. Exactly. I think oh, you and I talked about monsters once, right? Like we yes. deal with monsters. <laughs> yes, because yeah. we all have our own monsters inside of us, and it's how we take care of them, um, and how we tame them, and how we go up on life with having them somehow but quieting them down and, and, and bringing the best, actually, monsters, because we can have really great monsters. Yeah. Yeah, we can paint those monsters, right? right. I think so. I the mean, ugly I, painting. You know, I think in the abstract world that we live in, the non-objective uh, language, you know, everything is fair. And so yes. the way we approach our, our canvases, our blank canvases, it's just this also, you know, throwing yourself into this abyss and, and, and finding yourself. And that movement where you go back and forth with that canvas, it's that transformation, continuous transformation that happens. That's right. That's right. Continuous. And you're facing yourself continually. And that unfolds into the way I wrote with Bruce the next book, The Adjacent possible yes and we're gonna bring bruce in a little bit um but before we do that um nancy um i think that you know when we stop learning we become mediocre and by you know taking a class like yours that it's that master class um you're learning, but you're also learning from others, which is so important. We're not only taking a class from you, but we're learning from each other. And I think that's a key to be a better artist. It's a key. I mean, it is so fresh and it's so alive in these conversations. Again, we don't know where they're going and they're just fabulous conversations and learning from each other and being inspired and encouraged to continually experiment and evolve in our art and in our lives too. Yes, 100%. And um, tell us your, your approach um, for emerging artists, for example. What, how do you even start? Like if they're thinking of doing something, how do they start? What happens there? What, what makes them want to continue in this? What do you do to make them continue in this path? Well, first of all, is the inner landscape of saying yes. First of all, is trusting yourself enough to say, yes, I'm going to do this, even though I'm afraid. <laughs> even though I don't know what I'm doing, right? I'm going to go ahead anyway. It's going to right. so, so it's like the inner, and then, and that threads through everything, okay? And then it's like, start. We got to start. 
Okay, let's just get started. Let's open the creative channels. Let's get in there and play because we got to break through, you know, zero to one, you got to break through that tension, that resistance. We, and we've got to start and create lots of starts and so that we've got something to work with there, okay? So that's a lot of it is opening creative channels and it's, I always say there's a method to my madness. I know it looks kind of wild sometimes, but we're <laughs> just trying to give a sense of allowing and permission and get going. Cause you know what? All on your journey as an artist, way down the road, this can become an issue is coming back around and we got to start again. So sometimes right. you've been painting 20, 30 years, you got to come back and give yourself permission to go and start open creative channels. So that's a big piece, okay? And then the pieces around experimentation, we want to move past really emulating other work. I mean, at first that's fine because we're learning, but eventually that gets old. We want to create our own work and that that comes out of experimentation and not knowing and asking what if and exploring and actually embracing ugly art okay then once we are on fire with experimentation there another danger shows up this time the danger is uh-oh i'm starting to repeat myself <laughs> like you know what i mean emulating yeah. our not emulating others but we actually start emulating ourselves and that becomes a success disaster. So, exactly. you know what I mean? Like a success. You get static. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm, Oh, I'm selling out my 25 painting exhibition. Uh Oh, I'm starting to kind of, they're looking pretty predictable. <laughs> right? Exactly. So again, we're continually facing ourselves and our fears to, Whoa, I mean, I'm successful over here. How am I going to keep evolving? How do I keep it fresh? How do I not know and keep it alive? This is a big issue in your life cycle as an artist as you go down the road, especially for professional artists that are really doing great. This can become an issue. So how so, do you keep it fresh? So, you know, freshness is, again, this these foundational principles of, okay, let's start. Let's get in there and... You know, if you're feeling really blocked because you, you had all these successes and now you're afraid because that happens. Okay, mm -hmm. let's get back in. Inner journey, trust yourself, let's start. Let's do some playing. Let's do some six mac hats. Let's do some lots of starts, miles of canvas. Let's get in there and open it up. Then now we got, let's evolve. Let's experiment first. Play, tr you know, try different things, not knowing, allowing the ugly painting, all of that. And then eventually we evolve and evolving happens in a series. Okay. Because we're taking it somewhere new. The adjacent possible takes you somewhere new. And so that's evolving. We want to keep evolving. So there's a, this is like this, what I call the IC methodology. I've, I've put this together that I've seen in cycles of artists over time that I believe that we can know this and remember it we can come back and and go there again and again and again. So Well, it's it's that like um, learning how to use a bicycle, um, yeah. right? And so you know it and um, but it, it's it's a little bit different, but in a way it's like it's in their memory, it's there. It's but there. I don't know if it happens to you when you are not in your studio for a month, um, you start questioning yourself. Yep. How, how do I paint? Do I paint? How do I go for it? Like all Definitely. these questions start to, you know, emerge in you and it is frightening. It can be petrifying. Yeah, it absolutely can be. And it's absolutely like that can happen in anything, swimming, whatever, like, oh, I haven't done it in a month. Oh no. Do it, you know, do I really know what I'm doing? And again, you know, it's like, it comes back to your psychology. It's okay. I'm going to get in there and start. I'm going to get in there and just play around in the journal. I'm going to go in there and mix paint. Zero to one, right? Zero to one. And, and back in there. You know, sometimes we all, we think as established artists or whatever that we have to paint every time. And every time it needs to be either to sell it or to, or, you know, because it needs to be perfect. And that should get completely out of our zone. Completely yep. out of our psyche 
That's right. And this tendency to rush to the finish. I think we need more starts, fewer finishes. Focusing on the finish, focusing on the end result, you know, the perfectionism, trying to create the masterpiece. The problem is that we tend to crystallize too early. Yes. And we we want to yeah. we, we don't want to do that though. We want to keep it open. We want this attitude of experimentation and evolving. And what that takes a lot of trust to say, I'm going to allow myself to not know what's going right. to happen and that this thing might be really ugly <laughs> and actually that's a good thing <laughs> or the other or the other side of it is that you trap yourself thinking that you're enamored with what you're doing yeah and um that is the the counterpart of seeing that's something right. ugly you get enamored by the first three strokes that you're doing yeah, and enamored too by Stop. the successes. And you're afraid to keep going because you're afraid that you're going to mess it up. That's right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is why, again, we come back to the inner, you know, psychology. It's like, yeah. it is a mind game. And you've got to, you got to like really laugh. You got to really play. You've got to keep talking to yourself. Exactly. Exactly. That, one of the things that I do that I find really helpful, Sandra, you know, when I get into that, like what you're describing, like getting into, oh my gosh, I love this. <gasps> now I'm afraid, right? Is, you know what? I'll say, Nancy, this is all experimentation. These are exploratory works. These are experimental pieces. So it's like, it's fine. And this is how working in a series actually is great because you don't get too hung up on one particular one. It's like, okay, it's fine. I got right. 20 of these, you know, <laughs> like variations on exactly. whatever. Exactly. <laughs> And that's why it's important to do the repetition series and to show up and to just, like you said, you can use your sketchbook, you can use your pad in your kitchen, whatever it is, just let your hands be loose and not yeah. afraid. Yeah. Yeah. And you can work with your body. That's really fun. You know? Oh yeah. Rhythm oh. movement and all that. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And um, let me ask you something, um, uh, Nancy, um, you, well, not ask, I guess we're going to show now the work that you made for um, Feeding America. So we are selling a work from Nancy. If you're interested in purchasing this amazing original piece by Nancy, we're asking $250. Um, Nancy, do you have it there? So you can I do. show it. Um, right here. <laughs> proceeds are going to Feeding America. So um, if anyone is interested, please DM me or Nancy and we'll let you know what you have to do. Um, but remember, um, by purchasing this gorgeous piece of artwork from Nancy, you are going to be helping 2,500 meals. So um, yeah, wow. so please, please consider um, <laughs> buying this piece and helping others in in need of food because this is why i'm doing this i'm i'm you know it's all about artists helping artists but also uh this community incredible community that has gotten together to help our community at large that really needs our help right now so yep. thank you nancy for Aww. for doing this again and um we are bringing bruce um yes. your dear husband bruce. and co-author <laughs> here he comes and i'm gonna turn out the comments and then turn them on um <laughs> of the interview so we can see your faces hey bruce hey hi nice to see you good to see you too Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am so excited. Uh, and I would love for you to tell us about a little bit about you and your story and, and how you came up to be a co-author with Nancy. Wow, well, that, that's a long story. I don't think I have any time enough to tell the whole thing in detail. We might have maybe... a part two again. You know, you never know. So <laughs> but I'll start. Um, I'll start in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, after all of my academic training, I eventually ended up there and did an, a number of very unusual things. Um, one is I taught at a place called St. John's College, which is based on the Great Books program. Your entire four-year education is spent reading and discussing great books. And uh, it, it includes science and 
I already had a science background, but people there teach everything. So they call them tutors, not professors, because you're sort of enabling the learning process rather than um, you know, lecturing one way. It's, it's two way. And so I got to encounter all these things you don't encounter as a physics major, like Aeschylus and Sophocles and Aristotle. And, you know, science tends not to look backwards, or if it does, it's pretty myopic. If you read a science paper, there's a bunch of references at the end, but it only goes back, you know, five years. Maybe there's a couple token papers of, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, but everything else is kind of assumed and sort of invisible. Um, so that was when I first started thinking about how do fields progress? How do fields evolve? How do, become, how do they become as they are? And is it inevitable or not, especially in science? You know, there's a certain understanding of the world in science. And if we started, the, if we played the tape over again, would we end up with the same kind of science or something quite different? And I, then after teaching at St. John's, I spent time at a place called the Santa Fe Institute, which is a, a complex systems institute that is interdisciplinary. And so one of the issues in science is that the kind of more prestigious and well-known a department gets in a university, the higher the walls around it go. So people don't talk to each other so much and that, that's still a problem. But in Santa Fe, at the Santa Fe Institute, the idea was to have people talk to each other. And so I started realizing it was very enjoyable to talk to all these people in different fields like anthropology and uh, ecology and economics and the what you also don't usually encounter as a physicist. And I started realizing that it was very social science, which is different than social science. <laughs> and it was, um, you know, the Institute was set up in such a way they had all these glass partitions and uh, lots of markers in front of each of them. And you could draw on all of them. And the place was, well, it sort of looked like an art gallery. <laughs> because <laughs> there were all these patterns and equations and all this, and there was a kind of abstracted form to it. And at the same time, of course, most of you know that Santa Fe is a famous art town. And so there are lots of galleries, and one would go to the openings on Friday night to see your friends and drink free wine and occasionally <laughs> look at the art. And, you know, I discovered work that... Work play, work play. <laughs> work play. I discovered that 95% of the art I didn't like. But the wow. amount of art was so great that the 5% that I did like was a lot. And this was the same thing was true at the Institute. It was that 95% of the conversations never went anywhere. And it was, you know, I wouldn't call them chaff exactly, you know, wheat and chaff, but they were, you know, they were useful backgrounding, but it didn't change the course of your inquiry or career. But that 5%, well, maybe did. And that 5% was pretty big because there were so many conversations. And this bears on what you were talking about, just start. Yeah. You need to make lots of starts to get something good. And so I started, I knew a lot of artists there. And I noticed that um, they would toil in obscurity for about 10 years. It seemed to, there seemed to be about 10 years or so. And then all of a sudden they would have a winter exhibition. They'd become known. Their art, their art would go from selling for hundreds of dollars to thousands and maybe more. They'd sell out exhibitions and uh, were, were known in the town and then beyond the town. And I thought, well, what's going on? Why, why does it take 10 years? Because at least initially, I was pretty naive about art and I would look at it and I'd say, you know, that art was good 10 years ago and now it's, now it's good. And uh, all of a sudden it's famous. And so that started making me think about the process of art and just start. Well, eventually I left Santa Fe and moved to Santa Cruz um, because I'm a water person and it is just too dry there for me. Had a lot and of I heard, I heard that you actually go in the ocean with like I, really I, I, cold and no wetsuits are allowed in your life. That's pretty much true. <laughs> You know, people think the ocean is warm in California, and uh, it is warmer in Southern California, but up here it is not. Um, really it varies cold. between, oh, 50 and 62 degrees for the most part. Um, so it's, it's quite cold. Tell me there's a scientific thing that will keep you living until 120 by doing that or something? <laughs> well, you know, I've, I've started to see articles about living a long time based on... Um, frequent cold water exposure. And in fact, there was an attorney 
in the 19th century who was involved in the beginnings of Wells Fargo Bank in San Francisco. And he built a mansion on the shores of Lake Tahoe that's now a state park. And what, he lived to his late 90s, which is pretty amazing for the 1800s. But he swam in Lake Tahoe every day, which is also plenty cold. <laughs> so I, there okay. is a kind of precedent for this. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So one, one of the things that happened in Santa Cruz was that I, I met Nancy. <laughs> and uh, of course, she's an artist. And so we started talking about art and science and the connections between them. And, you know, I'm, I've trained as a physicist, but a theoretical physicist. So it's very mathematical. And if you ask somebody who doesn't study mathematics what mathematics is about, they'll say, well, of course, it's about numbers. Big numbers, small numbers, prime numbers, odd numbers. Um, it's about numbers, but that's not true. It's like that art is about technique. Well, math is like numbers is sort of the same thing as art is about technique. Numbers are a tool to understand more abstract things like um, patterns and forms. And that in that sense, the goal of art and mathematics is, is fairly close, that it's about understanding abstract forms and patterns. And numbers help you do that in mathematics. And perhaps technique helps you do that in art. Uh, so did you know that um, when you met Nancy, the science came first, or the art, or the merger, or what, what was it? <laughs> well, it was a gradual process of, of finding commonalities to talk about. I think maybe one of the first things we talked about was the the psychology, the social process by which understanding evolves. So because before Santa Fe, I hadn't really thought about the history of science. How did it become as it is? And was it completely inevitable or not? Or were there kind of left sharp turns back in the history somewhere that might have gone differently? And I started thinking, well, is that, is that true in art? How does, how does art evolve? And we had lots of good conversations. We walk every day. Not every day, most days, and walk and talk. And those conversations have added up to books over the years. <laughs> I know. it's it's um, and, and let's just jump into the new book um, that is already out, and it's already a successful book. And Nancy, if you want to show us again the cover of the book. Yeah. Um, Here it is. I'll show you. And where can we find um, all of the books? Amazon? Amazon. You can find them on Amazon. And there's also, I think, on Barnes & Noble. Okay. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about how this actual book came about to be. Yeah, so this, The Adjacent Possible, really came about to be after thinking about the life cycle of being an artist. And this, what we were talking about, this I see, you know, this inner landscape, the psychology is the overarching idea that affects everything. And then there's three movements or actions that I was seeing, and that is start, experiment, evolve. So we got to start zero to one or nothing happens, right? Right. <laughs> Lots of starts, miles of canvas, you know, it's, it's fantastic because it opens it up as Bruce was saying, opens up possibilities, lots of starts. Well, then what happens is we may be doing lots of starts and everything, but we may still be emulating other artists and not really getting to that deepest work that we came here to do. So we need to experiment. We need to allow ourselves to go in there and go, I don't know what I'm doing, which is actually, I'm always clapping when people say that. <laughs> it's good. Actually, it's great that you don't know. That you don't yeah. go in there already with, with a plan, a strategy, and a Cartesian grid you're laying over this painting to get to this masterpiece. Rather, you're asking the questions, the rhetorical question of what if. And you're, you are actually embracing re real ugly art that emerges because you actually understand that that's often the nascent embryonic form of new work that's trying to come through, is trying to change, and then it moves into evolve. And this is really the adjacent possible. This maps onto the adjacent possible, which is something that Bruce and Stuart Kaufman and various people at the Santa Fe Institute were looking at in evolutionary biology back in the 90s, which is that, you know, as you make a move 
it, I, this is how I'm translating it to art. You, you have one foot in the known, one foot in the unknown. And each move you make, it was not only invisible before, but it didn't exist before you made that move. You're continually on evolving that painting. And we do that through series. <clears throat> so again, we're, we're, we're starting, we start experimenting, and then we keep moving into a series that we're working on, and we don't know where that's going to go. And maybe that series, each one is changing and shifting and evolving and surprising us. And then what happens is that could then lead into a whole other series, right? Again, we want to cultivate surprise. So is that is that a um, a concept from biology as well, and and that is how you are transmitting it into the art world? Well, that's my interpretation of it. I mean, Bruce can probably talk to you more about that. Well, those those glass <laughs> partitions were full of you know words and diagrams and equations about the adjacent possible or more kind of generally how how open systems evolve. So physics is very good at studying very abstract systems like Newton realized that the earth and the moon, well, the moon is a big cratered ball of rock and the earth is full of life and history, the blue green planet. But he didn't care about any of that for his purpose. He just thought there are two points with a force connecting them. And physics makes use of abstraction and it can be very powerful. But one of the abstractions that physics does, because it turns out to be very powerful, is the idea of a closed system. So if you want to understand the ideal gas law, the, re the relation of pressure, volume, and temperature, you consider a box full of gas. Every molecule is like every other molecule. You make a number of assumptions, and that allows you to make derive astonishing results that aren't always exactly right, but they're very often close. And so abstraction gives reasoning power in science. Um, I and so that. when we started thinking about systems that, and then biology traditionally has been sort of narrative. Well, we've, these turtles swam around for a while, then they settled on this island and then this and then that, They're telling a story and bridging the gap between story and abstraction is a challenge of, and a complex system science. Yeah, I mean, what a great concept to come together and explain it to us mortals. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right? It is well, a very complex uh, way to put it out there, but I think you guys are, are the way it's coming out and um, the way it, it sounds more scary than actually doing it, right? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, I think that once you put yourself um, and you read <clears throat> the book, um, you will come into a much more understanding way of your three points that you're trying yeah. to get. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, I love this story of, of Jun Utzen. We've told it before, but Jun Utzen was a Danish architect. And he, he uh, developed, he created the Sydney Opera House. He, he designed that. Okay. Just a phenomenal architecture. And he, he worked with the principle, the principles, not techniques. He worked with the principle called monocoque, French word for one hole, single shell, single shell, like the egg is a perfect example of monocle. Right. right. Perfect design. So he worked with this concept and he took it to, he was applying for this and he took it to design his design for the Sydney Opera House. Instead of repeating what everybody else has done for centuries with just some variations, instead of it looking like a cathedral from previously or whatever, you know, or a building right. from previously. Uh, he did something new. It took him somewhere new. And that's what we want to do as artists, is go someplace new. Right? I love it. And um, I'm going to open um, to questions right now. Um, so if you have any questions, this will be a great time to ask questions for Nancy and Bruce. But Nancy, when do you start your new master class and... Um, Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. So, okay. So next week on Tuesday through Friday, we're going to have a, a little workshop to kind of give you a taste of how we work, how I teach, how we interact and all that. And so that's happening next week. And it's, it's going to be called From No to Flow. 
uh, creating paintings that wow you. Okay, and so it's just going to take you through some of what we've been talking about here a little bit more. We're going to play with that. And the way you can get into that is write to us at support at nancyhillis.com and you can just say, I'd like to get a link to the workshop. I'll also be putting it on the blog at artistjourney.com. It'll be down at the bottom of the blog that we put out every Sunday. So, you know, get in there and register for that. I'll be going live Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, 10 o'clock Pacific time. On Instagram, on Facebook, on what? It's going to be on, we're going to use Zoom, but we're going to put it onto Facebook. Okay. Okay. So we'll have more details about that. That's going to be a lot of fun. Then, and we'll have some fun things the week after that. We're going to have some launch parties and we're going to have some artists from the masterclass on like on Thursday. Again, that's going to be on Facebook Live uh, at 10 o'clock Pacific. The next Thursday after that, <clears throat> which is like the 14th, I think. Yeah. Then the masterclass starts on the 18th, Monday the 18th. So of October. So oh, very excited so to bring in new people. And my masterclass artists are excited to meet new people it's like it's a great deal of fun and amazing artists are in there one of our viewers is getting the books for sure she said so yay, uh, <laughs> I yay. Think, uh, yeah it's um yeah we we um they're asking if they're familiar with eric meisel's work around creativity coaching yeah, I think Eric Maisel is, he might be over in Berkeley. He's a creativity coach. He's been doing that for a long time. Yes, he's written books for years. I believe he's a psychologist. He's worked with artists, but also musicians for years. Yeah. Fabulous yeah. coach. In fact, so I was interviewed once. When are you once. coming into the master class? Are you going to be involved in, in any of the creative part of it? or? Yeah, I'm in there. I mean, I created the whole all the art bundles there's like it's a 12 week intensive but then we go for a you know whole year but 12 weeks are really going intensively into the material then we do our artist spotlights and you know all the conversations which has been so much fun and you know that's the interaction that's getting to know people that's been a godsend in this time of having those we have a huge community that has been following you for years and and trust you and because you guys are um very respectable in this community and um you're honest and you are so knowledgeable that if you are thinking of of taking a course this year i would highly highly recommend you um you know taking a chance with nancy you will never for regret this i i promise I promise Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. <laughs> and it's a lot of fun. It's so fun. Right? Yes. Someone said that they have the book already and they are they can't wait to dig into it. So um Thank you. yeah, and they said that it's a wonderful intro for the book. So um the way that you just spoke now. So I'm excited for you. Um Bruce, how are you gonna be involved uh, or not on the master class? Well, I'll probably be brought in to speak here and there, especially about some of these concepts from the adjacent possible. Yes. Um, and how that affects art. Yeah. Yes. So, um, Irma, the book titles are The Adjacent Possible and The Artist's uh, Journey. And uh, I will be posting that under my, um, on the, on the feed. So, um, so don't worry about that. And, um, uh, one more thing. Can you show us again the painting that we're donating today? Um, yes, yes. I, uh, please, if someone is interested, like I said, just um, direct message me or Nancy and we'll give you directions on how to make that donation. It goes directly into Feeding America. We're asking for $250 for it. So let's keep going and let's keep uh, helping people. So far, we've raised $30,000. So that's 300,000 meals. So let's keep going. <laughs> that is fantastic, Sandra. And just so people know, <clears throat> with the Adjacent Possible, we have been donating 100% of proceeds from the ebook to Feeding America. And we're still doing that. Yeah. yeah. This is like close, to, this is very much close to our heart, too. Uh, 
you know, mediating food insecurity. We've got a community fridge out here. We also give to community fridges. We have it and we stock it and people come every day and get the food they need, including the elderly. You know, I come from a third world country. I come from Mexico City where, you know, it is the food and poverty is, is it's really heartbreaking. And I never thought that moving into the United States that I would find um, the need for food in a way that I, I just never thought that being here, we would have that kind of a problem. Right. And the problem is huge. And it's so huge. it is, it's, it's a problem. And I don't see when it's going to end. I, I don't see how we're going to end the problem. So we can only be part of the solution. That's right. And even if it's, you know, one interview at a time and one painting at a time, you know, right. We are doing the best that we can. You guys are doing the best that you can with the book. I mean, um, it just takes right. a little bit of effort from all of us. And, and hopefully we can tackle this somehow. It's a big right. problem. It is a big problem. It's just one step mm -hmm. at a time, one book at a time, one painting at a time, one interview at a time, zero to one. And we can do this. We can do this. Yes, we can. And I can't thank you enough for um, Bruce and Nancy for joining me today um, tap into your creativity. This has been an incredible interview as always, Nancy. I mean, oh. just one hour went in a heart rate. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you bring me alive, Sandra. You, there's something about being in the conversation with you. You just, it's just, I, it, it you know, I just feel elated when I talk with you. <laughs> yeah. We, we feed from each other's energy and, and that's what, you know, it's just incredible. So, yeah. um, so thank you. Somebody just bought the book. Aww, um, thank thank you, you so much. Um, and again, um, yeah. thanks, Nancy. Thank you, Bruce. We'll see you. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna be off until October 30th with Robert Zott. So oh, stay tuned great. for that one. Yes, oh, I love him. Fantastic. Yeah. Yes. 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 I, yes. I, I want to thank you and for the beautiful work you're doing, and I want to thank everyone who's here. I can see, you know, things scrolling around. <laughs> I appreciate the hearts, and it's it gives me a lot of energy just to see that. So thank you, all of you, for being here. I appreciate you. Thank and you, guys. Thank you for letting me be part of this. <laughs> of course. You know what, Bruce? We can't get enough from you. So we might have to have another one in about six months or so. I'm not letting you go so easily. Oh, all right. <laughs> I'll stay right here. Have a great day, you guys. Okay, you too. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> See ya.